Welcome back. We uh, are now going to embark on module three. Uh, the nice part about this is it's the next deeper level of detail. In particular, we're going to provide more detail on the GNSS orbits and the GNSS signals. In both cases, we may well use GPS as the, advantage, uh, as the example, but bear in mind that what we have to say about GNSS orbits and signals is applicable to all of the satellite navigation systems, be it uh, GPS, Galileo, Beidou, or GLONASS. We'll begin by talking about GNSS orbits, and a little bit for fun, we'll take that in a historical perspective. Here is a brief history of astrodynamics. And there are any number of beautiful books on this subject, any number of great courses. So if you find yourself enjoying this and wondering how can I get deeper, uh, pl pl please uh, know that there are many routes to have a deeper feeling for it. Here we just have the greats listed on the left. And they begin with Nicholas Copernicus, 1543. Galileo Galilei Galilei in 1632, Tycho Brahe from 1546 to 1601, Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein. All of them had an impact on GPS and the GNSS orbits. Certainly it was Copernicus who first began to revisit the notion that our solar system is centered on the sun, that it's heocentric rather than geocentric. And that was a, a tough road to uh, travel in those days where the religions really preferred the notion of an earth-centered universe rather than a sun-centered universe. And Galileo supported that view and it's really the work of the central three people that we'll talk about because they're the ones who really matured this thinking of a heliocentric um, solar system. Albert Einstein, we list him here too because there are two corrections made by GPS for relativistic effects. <clears throat> One of them is made in the satellite and it's just an offset in the frequency of the clock on board the satellite and an offset in the carrier frequencies that are broadcast to compensate for one relativistic effect and the other correction is actually made in the GPS receivers. Um, we won't take that up as part of this module. Here we'll really focus on Brahe, Kepler, and Newton. <clears throat> now you may wonder why do I show this metal nose on the right-hand side. And such a nose was worn by Tycho Brahe, who was a nobleman in Denmark during the time period there. And uh, he was richly funded to go ahead and make his observations of the celestial bodies, the planets and the stars. He was also quite uh, a lad and um, he got into an argument with a professor about the, the proof or some um, uh, technical problem, scientific problem, and they could not settle the argument until they had the duel, and the professor knocked off his nose uh, in that duel. I don't know what happened to the professor, but uh, um, uh, Brahe had to wear a nose not unlike the one shown there on the right from that day forward. <clears throat> when we think about this triad, Brahe, Kepler, Newton, it was really Brahe that collected the data that established the formal beginning of astrodynamics. And it was really Kepler who analyzed the data from an empirical point of view and discovered that the planetary orbits around the sun were in ellipses. And it was really Newton who proved why that was true. And to, to make that proof, he had to not only invent the law of universal gravitation, which is shown there, but also the three laws of motion. Let's take a little bit closer look at what all this meant. 
Here are Kepler's three laws. <clears throat> and he stated these without explanation, without explaining why these were true. He said, these are the laws that best fit the data that Brahe collected. The first of them is here in the upper left. And he said, the planetary orbits about the sun describe ellipses. And as you go forward into astrodynamics, as you go forward into GPS, you'll discover that a basic knowledge of the mathematics of ellipses is necessary. So <clears throat> we show here the ellipse, this dark curve on the outside, coming down this way. And the lighter object will follow an elliptical path around, let's say, the sun. So if we're talking about planets, the planets will describe ellipses with the sun at one of the foci of that ellipse. If we're talking about Earth satellites, the satellites will describe ellipses with the Earth at one of the foci. Having that as a starting point, we can talk about perigee. That's the place of closest passage of the satellite to the Earth. And apogee, that's the place of greatest distance on that ellipse. And the semi-major axis, when multiplied by two, is the breadth or the length of that long axis of the ellipse. And the semi-minor axis, B, is the length of the shortest axis. And then you can write expressions for uh, how far is it from the center of the ellipse out to one of the foci, in fact, either of the foci. And that would be A times E. So A is half the length of this longest axis. E is eccentricity. It measures how great a departure the ellipse makes from a circle. If E is equal to zero, then the ellipse reduces to a special case, which is the circle. That was law number one. Planets make elliptical orbits around the sun. Law number two was as they move around, they sweep out equal areas in equal times. So now Kepler was talking about the motion of the planet through that or along that ellipse. And so that what that means is that if the planet is close to the sun, so it's close to perigee, that in a given amount of time, let's say a month or so, it will sweep out this area here. If the planet is far from the sun, near apogee, in that same amount of time, in one month, it will move a lot less along the ellipse, but the area that it sweeps in that time will be equal to the area that it swept back here. I'll try and draw that here. So law number two was equal areas in equal time. And then finally, law number three was an expression for what was the amount of time to get all the way around the ellipse. In other words, what's the orbital period? So capital T here is the orbital period. And what Kepler found is that that orbital period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis A cubed. So that was a nice connection, too. It meant that you could have orbits of very different shapes, let's say a very circular one like the dashed thing shown here, and an elliptical one, and in fact quite an eccentric one, shown by this ellipse here. <clears throat> and even though they had very different shapes, if they had the same semi-major axis, lowercase a, they would have the same orbital periods. Now, GPS, certainly uh, from viewed from a distance, the orbits are very close to being circular, very, very close to being circular. However, since GPS is used for providing positional or navigation accuracies of one meter, we do have to accommodate the fact that they're not 
perfect circles. And GPS broadcasts information about its eccentricity, E, and that number is not exactly equal to zero. <clears throat> it was Newton who then looked at these observations and developed gravitational theory and his three laws to explain why the planets were moving in ellipses. And we have here a rather uh, short derivation. And this first expression here is the force due to gravity, so F sub G, on an nth body. So in my little sketch here, I just show two bodies. So this would be capital J equal to 2. But in general, when we're in the solar system, we have many more bodies than that. So the general expression is the one shown here in the upper left. It says the force due to gravity on the nth body is the sum of the four gravitational forces due to the other j bodies. So I've uh, kind of obscured it here, but this sum runs from j equal 1 to capital J, excluding n. So we don't have to talk about the gravitational force of the nth body on itself. Is equal to the universal gravitational constant, capital G. The value for that is given over here on the right-hand side. Times the mass of the body under test, mn, times the sum of these terms, which represent the force from each of the other J bodies. And so we have the product of M of the body under test and the mass of the Jth body. And we have the vector from J to N associated with this quotient R cubed Jn. So this gives the direction of the gravitational force. And this gives the magnitude of the gravitational force. <clears throat> now bear in mind that this r also has magnitude r uh, without the underbar. And so we talk about the gravitational force as being a 1 over r squared force, because one of these r's disappears when we uh, have this in the numerator. And so the fundamental finding of Newton was that if we have a body subject to a 1 over r squared force, it will follow a trajectory which is described by a conic section. And included amongst conic sections are ellipses. So that's really uh, Newton's enormous contribution. If we divide both sides through by mass, well, force divided by mass will give us the acceleration here. And uh, so we're now talking about the acceleration of the nth body, and uh, we've uh, retained the rest of the right-hand side. We go ahead and do some operations on this, a little bit of algebra. Be patient with yourself. It's not immediately obvious how to do this step here, but it's worth it because what we do is we separate out the contributions on the right-hand side of, let's say, the closest of the capital J bodies. So we write R double dot, the acceleration of the body under test in inertial space, is equal to this times the vector from 1 to 2 divided by R cubed, 1 to 2, uh, here's the mass of 1, here's the mass of 2, and here's the universal gravitational constant. So think about this as in the following. Think about n, the nth body, the body under test, being the satellite. And think about this body number 1 as being the Earth. And then these other j minus 3 terms are due to the moon and the other planets and the sun. So this is really the thing that dominates. 
Because if we look at the sizes of those forces on a satellite, the gravitational force to the Earth dominates, and dominates by quite a bit. Having said that, if we want to be complete, we do include sun-moon forces. So we'll come back to that in a little while and show how GPS incorporates that. For the time being, let's ignore it. What that means <clears throat> is that we're working the so-called two-body problem. It continues up here in the upper left. The mass of the Earth is huge compared to the mass of any satellite. So we just neglect the lowercase m here. And so we also set that to 0. And that means our equation simplifies to this. And then since we're working satellite orbits around the Earth, we take this product, g, the universal gravitational constant, times the mass of the Earth. We take that product and we call it mu. And so now, finally, our expression has reduced to this rather simple thing. It's so important, it has the name that we give it at the top of the chart. It is the fundamental orbital differential equation. It's not such an easy thing to solve. <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult because it's not linear. It has r appearing here cubed in the denominator. So it's not just a bunch of derivatives of r multiplied together or weighted together with linear coefficients. Even so, this is the equation that Newton solved. And he found that if this fundamental orbital differential equation was in force, then the solutions would have this form. r is the distance from the central planet out to the satellite, from the Earth out to the satellite. And he also knew that equations of this form, or trajectories of this form, defined ellipses. And it was in this way that he proved Kepler's first law. A little bit of detail, it's important. <clears throat> A is the semi-major axis that we talked about earlier. E is still the eccentricity. And nu, this angle here, is the angle to the satellite location from the Earth past perigee. And that angle, by the way, is called the true anomaly. So keep that in mind. Needless to say, the GPS receiver has to solve for the true, true anomaly to know where the satellite is located uh, relative to the Earth. In general, by the way, <clears throat> that expression that Newton came to that gave the length of the vector from the Earth to the satellite uh, is satisfied certainly by ellipses, but it's satisfied by a greater class of curves than simply ellipses. And if you draw a conic, and that's what we've drawn here in the background, that's this uh, uh, cone down here taken together with this cone up here. So think of it as two ice cream cones held small tip to small tip. That's the conic, and the section is the intersection of that conic with any plane, any slice that you may take through that pair of ice cream cones. So when you take a slice like this and you look at the intersection, it appears in there. We don't see all of it, but you see part of it. That's an ellipse. If we were to take that section and come in exactly perpendicular, to the axis between the cones, that would be a circle. So the special case E equals zero is included in Newton's solution 
to the fundamental orbital differential equation. Interestingly, take a look on the right-hand side. The same con conic appears there, but now the section is taken, boom, vertically. In this case, the intersection is shown here and here, and the foci appears in between. This is not for a so-called closed orbit. This is for an asteroid or a meteor that appears close to the Earth, swoops in, let's say, but then goes to infinite distance. It's not going to make a circle. It's not coming back. So there are certainly many objects in space that have that kind of trajectory relative to the Earth, too. So this is part of the beauty of the Newtonian theory that it not only solved for the ellipses that Kepler saw in the planetary data, it solved for the asteroids that pass and comets that pass, let's say, even close to the Earth and then just disappear far into the solar system. So the detail that we're going to provide in the next snippets have to do with this drawing. We'll stop worrying about hyperbola and parabolic conic sections. We're just going to stick with the, with the ellipse. And think of this drawing as in the following way. Here's the Earth down here at the center. Here's the satellite out here. We can go SV if you like, and we can give the traditional symbol to the Earth in there at the middle. So that's Gaia, and here is the ellipse surrounding the Earth. The important aspect that what we, of what we show here is how are we going to describe an elliptic orbit around the central body, the Earth? And it's done with six parameters. It takes six parameters to really do a good job of it. Just to remind you, here's the ellipse. Here's perigee, the point of closest approach. Apogee is down here to the left somewhere. The first parameter we have to give describes the look the shape of the orbit itself. It doesn't yet connect the orbit to Earth. And that's given with two parameters, the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. So we can call those one and two, if you like. So they, in the parlance, just describe what the orbit looks like. The next thing we have to do is we have to attach that ellipse to the Earth. And that takes three more parameters, the first one of which is the longitude of the ascending node. And that occurs, the ascending node occurs right here. That's where the satellite punches up through the equatorial plane. And that node, the ascending node is right there, makes an angle, capital omega, with this vector that points out from the Earth into the fixed stars. So it's an inertial, inertially fixed vector. We'll come back to how it's defined in a little while, but for the time being, let's just regard that vector, call that vector the vernal equinox. The next parameter we need is lowercase omega. So as we follow the satellite through the equator, it goes up this way. How long from the ascending node, or with what angle is required to reach perigee, we call that the argument of perigee. So here we have the longitude of the ascending node. Here we have argument of perigee. There's one more angle we need to orient this ellipse relative to the Earth, and that's the pitch it makes with respect to the equatorial plane. And that's right here. That's so-called inclination. And that's parameter number five. <clears throat> By the way, there's nothing magical about the numbering system I'm giving here, this one through five. Uh, but the, the important thing is that altogether there are six Keplerian parameters. The sixth one is required not to describe the shape of the orbit, not to describe the orientation of the orbit relative to the Earth, 
but rather to place the satellite in the orbit. So it kind of comes from a third uh, uh, goal. And that, as we've already mentioned, is right here. That's the true anomaly. And we can call that parameter number six and give it the symbol nu. So you've been exposed now to one of the most delicate and deep aspects of GPS. If we are to navigate on the surface of the Earth using GPS, and we're receiving these signals, we certainly need to know where we're, we're receiving them from. In other words, we need to know the location of the SV. <clears throat> and we need to know that location for all the satellites we intend to use, maybe 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That location is broadcast by the satellites using the Keplerian parameters. So if you look at the content of the nav message, we will later, but I encourage you to go ahead and look at immediately. You'll see that the key parameters sent in the nav navigation message are the six Keplerian parameters that we've just described. When we come together next time, we'll talk about it some more. Until then, good luck.